Thank you. Um, I'm here to talk about business planning. I'm the business entrepreneur instructor at Dakota County Technical College. I've been teaching there for about 12 years. I didn't start teaching until I was 52, and that's when I actually found out what I really love to do with myself. I'm passionate about teaching, and I'm passionate about helping people start businesses. In fact, I, for the last three years, I've done over 200 seminars on starting a business at workforce centers because if you ever go to a workforce center, there's a lot of dislocated workers there and a lot of people 50 and older in that category who can't get jobs anymore. Well, one of the things you can always do is start a business. And I'm a big proponent that if you're gonna start a business, you need to do a business plan prior to starting your business. Now, there was a person who asked a question at the last one that says, what do you do with a startup how do you project sales? How do you do all this stuff and everything else? Well, the way I teach it, the way I teach, I, if I'd like to answer that question, we use what's called, it's a very scientific method called the SWAG method. <laughs> and it stands for swinging wild ass guess. <laughs> and, and that's exactly what you do when you start building projections for a new business. That's the only way to do it. Um, you actually start by guessing and putting things into columns and everything else. And after you do this for a while, you actually get, it actually begins to feel right to you and you actually get some really good numbers. In a little bit, I'm also going to tell you another thing you can do to get some of that information as well. But I'm going to talk about business planning and the importance of business planning. But before I do that, let me establish my credibility, give you a little background on myself. One of the things I do when I teach selling, whether it's to selling at the college or selling to other people, is that most salespeople don't know they should do this, but whenever you meet a prospect for the first time, before you start asking them questions, which is what salespeople are taught to do, whenever you meet somebody for the first time, you ask them questions to uncover wants and needs. What you really should do first is spend 15 to 35 seconds establishing your credibility up front. And you can do this with whatever you sell. And it's amazing if you do that, how things change, how the price objection goes away. And I started new a semester two uh, last week. And so I was talking about this in one of my sales classes and there was a young lady in there who works for Fantastic Sam's. She's a stylist and she wants to open up her own salon. So we were talking about this establishing your credibility and she worked on one for about 30 seconds. And I said, now, every time at Fantastic Sam's, when somebody comes in, if you don't know them, before you ask them about what they want done with their hair, just tell 30 seconds about who you are and see what happens. And she did. She came back last night to tell me what the result. And it was amazing. She said, I can't believe how nice the people were after I did that. And she said, my tips doubled in one week. And so now she's got other people at Fantastic Sam's doing that. So I believe in establishing credibility up front. So what I'd like to do now is establish my credibility. I can see, oh, I can see this, okay. I'm an entrepreneur and a business owner and I've started and run five businesses. And there's two words up there. One is entrepreneur, you've all heard that word. The other is a word that I kind of coined called biz owner, which is short for business owner. And the reason I decided to change the words is because I can't stand the word entrepreneur. It's because I can't spell it. <laughs> you try spelling it. And on top of that, I'm the business entrepreneur instructor at Dakota County Technical College. So on any given day, I have to type that freaking word about 10 times. <laughs> And every time I do, I get it wrong. So I change it to biz owner. And in reality, biz owner actually fits better because the businesses that are starting today, the people who start those businesses don't necessarily think of themselves as a president or a CAO. They think of themselves as the owner of the business. So I've started and run five businesses and I should have brought it with me. I, I'm an actual inventor and I created a product called Video Buddy in the mid 90s. And for that, I had to raise a lot of money. So I'm an inventor, I hold two patents on what is called optical code technology, and I've raised a lot of money from what are called angel investors. You've all watched the show Shark Tank? Okay, there's two types of investors. There's shark investors and there's angel investors. Minnesota, because it's Minnesota nice, has a whole <laughs> bunch of angel investors. In fact, there are over 4,000 angel investors in the state of Minnesota. And I will tell you right now from experience, if you have to raise money for a business, Minnesota is really a great place to raise money for a business. So I've raised a lot of money from angel investors. I've raised about $6 million with the largest single check I ever got from one guy was $3 million. And when I got the check, I actually went to Kinko's and made 10 colored copies of it. <laughs> Unfortunately, they would only let me cash the original. They wouldn't let me do any of the other. But if anybody wants to see a $3 million check, I can give you that. I'm also business entrepreneur faculty at Dakota County Technical College. I've been teaching there for 12 years and I absolutely love it. 
Uh, today's Thursday night, which means I taught Tuesday night, I teach Wednesday night, and tonight I'm going to run from here and go back to the college and teach a class on legal issues tonight. And I absolutely love this stuff. I really enjoy helping people start businesses. In 2008, I actually got an award. I was awarded the National Business Entrepreneur Instructor of the Year for all two-year colleges in the country, which was really pretty cool. I got a big thousand-dollar check and I got my name on the paper and that. And then the college thought I was famous. So what they did was they started using my face in all their marketing materials. <laughs> and the first thing they did was they put my face on the side of a 40-foot semi promoting the Business Entrepreneur <laughs> Program. So I'd be driving around and I'd see a picture of myself on this 40-foot semi and I'd go, wow, that's pretty cool. Get to see myself. But then they used me in one other marketing tactic, which was called bathroom advertising. <laughs> and they didn't do it in men's bathrooms, they did it in women's bathrooms. Now, I don't frequent women's bathrooms to see if my picture is there, but I started getting calls. I got a call one night, my wife's best friend is Mary, and I pick up the phone. She goes, hi, Bob, this is Mary. I said, hi, Mary, let me get Diane. She says, no, I want to talk to you. And I go, why? And she said, I want to tell you, I was in the green mill at Egan. I had to go to the bathroom. I go into the stall, I sit down, I close the door, and there's your face staring at me. And it freaked me out so much, I had to go to a different stall, and I just wanted you to know that. So if you remember anything about this, you can remember Bob frequents women's bathrooms. Okay. <laughs> I heard the, in another uh, one, I heard SCORE was mentioned, Service Corps Retired Executive. Great place to get free counseling services. But there's another place. It's called the SBDC. It stands for Small Business Development Center. And I am actually a counselor with the SBDC, which means anywhere from five to 10 hours a week, I meet one-on-one -on -one with people and counsel them uh, whether it's business planning, whether it's starting a business, whether it's funding a business, anything. And around the country, there are 9,000 SBDC counselors and about 14,000 SCORE counselors. And this is a free service to you, so if you don't use it, shame on you. And the difference between kind of the two is that all SCORE counselors are volunteer and all SBDC counselors, it's actually a part-time job. I get paid to do that. Since I like money, that's kind of the route I went. But these are services that are really good for you to use. And that what, what will happen is they'll try and match you up with whatever your need is. If you want to buy a franchise, they'll match you up with somebody who's already bought franchises, that sort of thing. So use these services. And the one thing that SCORE and the SBDC haven't done a good job of is actually uh, promoting themselves. So I'll do that, that for you. But those are two places where you can get free counseling services. In 11 years, I've helped over 1,000 students uh, start businesses and I, with clients with the SBDC. And I have another business on the side, as a lot of teachers do. I'm a new business author, and I create some online assessments. Okay, that's who I am. Now let's talk about business planning and what I know about business planning. Uh, I've written over 20 formal business plans which were used to raise over $6 million. The actual check that I got for $3 million, this is the exact business plan I used to get this. And this is a beautiful business plan. Uh, it's, it's got wonderful, it's got color, it's got graphics, and on the back of this are about 20 pages of what are called audited financials. And Steve over there knows what audited financials are. Audited financials are financial statements that are blessed by a CPA. And if you're raising the kind of money I was raising, that's what you had to have. This plan took me over 75 days to make and also cost me about $6,000 because I had to pay a person like Steve to bless my financials. That's not really what, and I had to do it to raise a lot of money, but that's not really the where business planning is right now. Business planning for most of the businesses that are starting needs to be shorter, faster, quicker, and a whole lot less than 80 pages. So just to give you background, that's where I come from. Uh, in the last 12 years, I have taught a formal three credit business plan class at the college 38 times. I teach it in the classroom, I teach it online, and I teach it as a hybrid course. I'm in the middle of a class right now, and, I, and I've been doing this for 12 years, and I will tell you the businesses that create a business plan prior to starting the business have the far best chance of success. It's really something that most people don't want to do, but you kind of have to do. And in fact, in the, if you think of the words business planning, one of the things I found out that when most people think of the word business planning, they get the same feeling comes over them as the word dentist does. <laughs> Which means that it's going, I can put it off, it's going to hurt, I'm going to bleed, it's going to cost me money, and those kind of things. And so we have a tendency to put that off. But business planning process is absolutely really critical to success. In the last 12 years, I've actually had to review and grade over a thousand business plans. 
And so I've seen them all. I've seen virtually any business that you can possibly think of. Yet, what always amazes me about people who are starting businesses, I was out at the table out there collecting business cards, and I'd look at the kind of businesses that were on there and go, wow, that's really cool. I never thought of that. And so there's always new businesses coming out. I also created a new way of doing business plan, which is called the 21 Bet Question Business Plan that makes the whole process easy and fun, and so anybody can do it. So that's kind of my background on business plans. Now, why should you create a business plan? Well, the number one reason people create a business plan is that they think they have to in order to raise money. If you go, have to go to a bank and get what is called debt financing, if you're gonna go out and get investors, which is called equity financing, you have to have a business plan. If you don't have one, it's like not having a business card. You look like an idiot. So you really have to do that. But the whole business planning for both investors and bankers has changed dramatically over the last 10 or 15 years. 10 or 15 years ago, when you were doing a business plan, that plan had to have what is called plot value. And plot value is nothing more, it's big and thick, and when you throw it on the table, it plops. It looks like you've got a lot of stuff into it. Most bank presidents and most angel investors right now will tell you, I don't want anything that big, because no offense, I'm not gonna make my decisions based on the plan anyway. I'm gonna base the decisions on the person and what I think about the person. And so business plans have gotten a whole lot shorter and a whole lot quicker to do. So a business plan, most people when they think of a business plan, they say, okay, I gotta raise money, I'm gonna do a business plan. But that's not why you do a business plan. A business plan actually impacts the success or failure of your new business startup. Anybody ever heard of a magazine called Business Week? Probably everybody's heard of a magazine called Business Week. Business Week, about seven or eight years ago, had an internet publication called Business Week Small Business. It wasn't in print, it was only on the internet. And one of the things they did was they did a whole big study of people who had created business plans prior to starting their business, after the business, or never did it. And they published their results on the internet, and I'll get you the article if you want it, but it, to break it down really quick, they said this. If you create even a simple business plan and go through the business plan process prior to starting your business, and the key is prior to starting your business, your chances of still being in business after three years is 85%, which is really high. By the way, there's a lot of misconceptions about failure rates of businesses right now. And the, new, the statistics, latest statistics on a national basis, if 100 businesses started today, about how many do you think are gonna be around a, a one year from now? Anybody care to guess? How many? 50? 15. That's, a normal, that's actually the normal answer. The new number, and this is, should encourage everybody, is 75%. Failure rates of businesses, first year is absolutely the highest, but it's 25%. And national excuse me, statistics are that you keep dropping down that after three years, anywhere between 48 and 50% of businesses are still in, in the mix. And so that should be good news. Business for failure rates are actually starting to go down. Success rates are going up. And one of the reasons is there's so much education now available on starting a business. 10 years ago, SBDC didn't exist, SCORE didn't exist, and so now there's just many more resources. So the, doing a business plan actually impacts the success or failure of your new business. A business plan also helps you decide if you're starting the right business. The first time I taught a business plan class about 12 years ago, I was doing my first class, I was in the classroom, there were about 22 people there, and along about week three or four, a number of students were coming up to me and they say, you know, I don't think this plan that I wanna do is gonna work, can I stop that plan and start another one? And I went, well, okay, that's pretty cool, go ahead. And it kind of, it, it bothered me that I thought, okay, they're going into this class, they're doing this business, and at the end of the class, they're doing either another business or that business has changed in some dramatic way. So the first semester it happened, I thought, well, this is an anomaly. But then it happened the second semester, the third semester, the fourth semester, and 38 semesters later, I can tell you that in every business plan class, first day of class, they tell me what business they're writing a plan on, I can tell you that somewhere between 20 and 35% of the people that complete that class have either thrown one business out and starting another, or they have changed the business they wanted to start in some dramatic way. And that's what the business planning process does. It, go, it allows you to go through this whole thing, and so at the end of it, you have the confidence to say, yes, this is the business I'm gonna start. So business planning also helps you decide if you're starting the right business. 
and a business plan and doing the financial part of it. And, and Steve already talked about the financial part, but you have to go through at least one year of simple projections. And in the past, business plans where you needed three to five years of projections that most investors, most, ba most bankers don't want any part of that right now because they know after, if you get out more than a year or a year and a half or two years, it's all gonna be BS anyway. Because it is, because no, the world is changing so fast. So your job, if you're gonna start a business, is to create at least one or two good, solid years of projections. He's calling it a budget, I'm calling it projection. Different terminology, we're kind of talking about the same thing. But you have to get comfortable with projections because all businesses run on money. And the thing that a lot of people that start a business are afraid of is this money thing and the accounting thing and all that. It's actually not that hard. There's a lot of spreadsheets to help you. And I would encourage you, if, you, if money is uncomfortable to you or, or keeping track of money, take a class on accounting. Do something to grow in that area because anybody can learn this stuff. You don't have to have a math degree to understand this. And lastly, a business plan shows you areas where your business might be vulnerable to failure. Because when you're answering a whole bunch of questions about a business, if you can't answer that question, you know that's an area that you need to work on. So this is really why you should create a business plan. And again, it's not the plan that's important. The plan doesn't really make a whole big a difference. It's what you go through as an individual going through that process that is the most important. So here are your business plan options. Actually, you can talk to me or you can Google business plan on the internet. If you've never Googled it, try it. There are 1.8 billion responses if you type in business plan. They're all over the place. There are over 100 companies. I, I actually went back on Google 120 pages and I because I, I wanted to see how many companies there were. I have identified 100 companies. They will either sell business plan services or sell you a template in order to do a business plan. And now the new thing is you subscribe to something and you can go online and do your plan online. There's one called Live Plan, which is put out by Palo Alto Software, which is business plan pro people and that sort of thing. And a number of colleges have picked that up as a using it and teach business plan. So you got a lot of options out there. Also, have you ever tried to download a free business plan on the specific business you want to start? because they're almost all on the internet. Whatever business it is, you should Google that, say, I need a business plan for a handyman business, for a dentist, whatever it is, and chances are you'll get eight or nine free business plans that you can download, and if you really just want a business plan, you could copy and paste yourself to way to a business plan. It's not gonna do any good, though, because you're using other people's words and ideas, and this is something that has to get inside of you. Also, there are a lot of companies out there, and I've identified over 50 that will write your plan for you. For a cost of anywhere between $300 and $10,000, they will write your business plan for you. I know of two people who have did this before I talked to them as an SBDC client, and what they got was a lot of generalizations. Many people think that if you're going out having to raise money, I need a great business plan. I need a professional business plan. In reality, that's not how investors or bankers make their decisions because most of them don't even read the plan. What they're really, what where an investor, and this might surprise you, where an angel investor makes a decision that they're going to invest on you is not on the presentation. And I'm really good at presentations because I know this. I've done over 300 one-on-one -on -one investor presentations with high net worth individuals. They don't base a decision during the presentation. They base the decision on the question and answer periods before, during, and after the presentation. When they're asking questions and you're answering questions is when the feeling comes over them that, okay, this person knows what they're talking about. When I first started raising money, I went 24 investor presentations before I ever got my first check. But I was smart enough, and when somebody said no to me, I'd say, why are you saying no to me? And they'd tell me, you're an idiot. I could, you didn't know what this was. <laughs> And in all honesty, if, if you're going to have raised money from angels, there's a language that you have to, to learn. And when I started this, nobody was there to teach me, and I didn't know the language. So people would ask me a question, I'm going, I don't even know what that means. And so, but after you do this enough, you learn the questions that investors or bankers are going to ask you. And that really is where your business plan comes in. It's not a document. The plan is what gets inside of you and gives you confidence that you can do what you say you're going to do. Lastly, you can take a business plan class. 
Anybody care to guess if 100 business plans start by people like this in the room, however many get completed? Anybody know? Five. Five? Actually, you're close. It's about 10. It's about 10% of people who start a business plan actually complete that business plan. If you want to complete a business plan, pay really good money and take a class in it. And I hope you need the grade because the only way, when I teach a business plan class, the only way people are going to get a grade is if they turn in a completed plan. So you're kind of forced to do it. Otherwise, you don't have to do it. So I wouldn't suggest that. By the way, it costs about 600 bucks to take one of my business plan classes. And this semester, I'm doing it online, and I maxed out at 30 people. So this is really a very important thing. Here's my best advice. Number one, you've got to understand that the purpose of a business plan is to get the plan inside of you. And only your words and your ideas are going to allow that to happen. So I don't believe you can copy and paste your way to a great plan. I don't believe anybody else can create your business plan for you. You need to create it yourself. By the way, you notice I'm not using the word write. I'm using the word create. And there's a reason for that. Most people, when they hear the phrase business plan, automatically think, I have to write 80 pages. How many in this room would you consider yourselves either a good writer or like to write? Okay, I'm guessing it's about 15% of the people in here. So automatically, 85% of the people, if you think you have to write something, probably aren't going to do it because writing isn't something that you enjoy doing. So one of the ways of not writing a business plan is just to answer a bunch of questions with highlights and bullet points. And I've discovered that this is a really good way for people who don't like to write to actually get a business plan out of them. But you, this is something you have to do. You also don't have to sweat the final product. Unless you're presenting a plan to investors, bankers, or something like that, that's the only time you really have to bind it and all this. When my students do a plan in the class, I tell them, if you're not going to present this to everybody, if you're doing it for you, which is what you should do, put it in a three-ring binder. And make sure you change it all the time, because business plans are living documents. This is not something you do once. And when you start a business, you are going to learn more in the first six months of starting and running that business than you did a whole lot before that. And you're going to learn some things that you may not have thought of. Those kind of things need to be in the plan. So I propose doing it in a three ring binder and just putting everything in there. If you form an LLC in the state of Minnesota, which probably a lot of them are there, you need what is called a company record book. I don't know if you know that or not. You need a company record book in order to have and hold annual meetings and have your bylaws in and minutes and everything else. It's a three ring binder where you can keep all the documents of your business. I propose you have another three ring binder and just call it business plan and keep adding to it on a regular basis. Um, business plans right now should be no longer than five to seven pages and including a page of financials. I want to show you another great business plan. This is a great business plan. I got $3 million. This is another business plan. This is actually a business plan from two brothers who took my program. It's even got a coffee stain on it. This is their original business plan. And you can see it doesn't look as pretty as that. You also can probably see it's not written in narrative, but this is their plan. It's, th it's three pages long. It's got a page of financials. And this is all the equipment they need in order to start their business. The company over in Eden Prairie is called Prime Signs LLC. It's a small commercial sign company started by two brothers who came from the ad business. And they will tell you going through this process that ended up with this, pardon my French, save their ass, is exactly what they told me. Because it forced them to think about things they hadn't thought of. And the big one was, they were looking at their target market. And their target market for a commercial sign company, they figured their target market, at least initially, was going to be schools, cities, all this other sort of stuff. But when I laid that over what I call a financial goal, and if you're going to write a business plan on something, you need to start with a goal. Um, I, Steve talked about having goals. Small business owners generally suck in a couple areas. I've, they really do. One area that they suck at is they, they're not goal setters. And so you need to start, start your business plan with a goal. And what has happened in, in, since 2006 that the economy has tanked, a lot of small businesses have gotten into what I call a survival mentality. And a survival mentality is, if I can just get through this year, I know next year will be better. Well, but if you do that year after year after year, pretty soon that survival mentality becomes a habit, and that's all the business ends up doing. 
So I would say the only way I know to get out of a survival mentality and get into a thriving mentality is to set a goal for your business. So when students come into my class on the first day, day of class, I force them to come up with a financial goal for their business. And to make it simple, their financial goal is this. How much money do I want to make each month off of that business? Now, they may not make it in the first month, but that's what they want to make. When you start with a goal or start with the end in mind, it's amazing how when you look at your business, if it's going to work or if it's not work. When I started my business plan class with a goal, it's amazing how the plans change. And part of that goal is, is to not just set a financial goal, but where it's, it also involves the other thing that small business owners suck at, which is setting prices for their products or services. Generally, small business owners charge too little for their products or services. They try to buy the business right from the very beginning. And a lot of small business owners who haven't created a business plan look at what the competition is doing and they start going lower. And the reason they go lower is because they're trying to buy business. That's not how you should set prices. Going through the business planning process and doing financials and learning to like numbers on a spreadsheet should tell you what your pricing should be for your business. And so that's why you do it. And so in one page of financial right now is enough. Now I told you there's something else you can do to really learn about your business. And it's called the interview assignment. And I guess I'm gonna be getting all your email addresses. So I'm gonna be sending you two eBooks that I've written. One, I'm gonna send you the question in this book, which is 21 Question Business Plan. I'm gonna send you an eBook called the interview assignment. When I first started teaching, I came up with this one assignment, which was whatever business you wanna start, go talk to people who are already doing it and ask them a whole bunch of questions do an interview with them. The only stipulation is you can't talk to people who would be your competition, because that's going to be unethical. So if you're a landscaper here in the Twin Cities, you can, might talk to a landscaper in Milwaukee or something like that. But when you talk to them, you ask them a whole bunch of questions. And you learn what works in marketing, what their profit picture is. You may have a whole marketing plan handed to you. You may have a business plan handed to you. I've had students come back from this assignment because they have to come into the class and tell what they did. And they go, I'm not doing that business anymore because they learned something that they didn't know. I've also had students come back with complete business plans handed to them. I had one guy who, the owner of this business, who was not a competitor, spent eight hours with this guy and taught him the business and actually got him vendor contracts to start his business. It's something that you, anybody can easily do, and guess what? It's free. At Dakota County Technical College, we've done over 2,500 interviews that I've sat through and listened to, and I will tell you this is the single best assignment I, I've ever come up with. So basically what I did is I put it in a small ebook, and I'll send that to you for being here today. So do the interview assignment, and that will help you. The, the question back here on how do I project sales right from the very beginning, go talk to somebody who's already done it and ask what they sold right from the very beginning. Now you're getting some real numbers from people. Here's something you may not have thought of. When people, th when people do business plans or things, they basically are writing. But in my, my classes, you not only have to write things and, tell, and, and that, but you also have to say them out loud. It is really important that whatever you write, from a business plan standpoint, from a marketing plan standpoint, you say it out loud. When you say things out loud, you hear it with a different set of ears. And you can see, you listen to yourself and you go, oh boy, that sounds like crap. Or yeah, that sounds really good. But the other thing it does, when you speak out loud, it gets in your head and it gets inside of you. That's what business plans have to be. They have to get inside of you. So start saying what you want out loud. And, and let me just share one quick story. A couple years ago, I was doing a business plan, a business plan class in a day at the college. And there were like 26 people around, in the, around the table. And so the five, first five minutes of class, I go around, I say, introduce yourself and tell us what business you're writing a plan on. So we're going around, and it was a U-shaped thing. And we got right to the middle there, and there's a woman probably about 55 years old. I thought she was about 55. And she says, this is who I am, and I'm not going to tell you what my business idea is. Go on to the next person. She said it just like that. And I'm going, oh, crap. Here's a woman who thinks she's got the greatest idea since white bread that's scared to tell anybody because she, doesn't, because she thinks somebody's going to steal it. So we go around the room, and everybody tells their business. And when everybody's done, I look right back at her and say, listen, everybody else has said what their business idea is. You need to tell everybody what your business idea is. And she took a deep breath, and she shared her story. 
She was 63 years old. Her and her husband had ran a construction company and they had been in the concrete part of construction. He died about two years earlier, he died of cancer, and she had gone through the grieving process. She didn't really need the money, but she had found a piece of equipment that she could buy for $5,000, which you could program, which would allow her to etch concrete, like concrete walls, concrete floors, which was really a pretty cool idea. So after she says that, there was a couple guys in the room that started asking her about this, and people were pretty excited. And I look over at her, and she's starting to cry. Now, I've had students cry in my classes before, but not in the first 10 minutes. It usually, <laughs> after they know me for a day and a half, then they, get to, then they start crying. But I asked her, I said, why are you crying? And she said, do you know this is the first time I have ever said what I wanted to do out loud? And I went, why? And she said, well, I'm 63 years old, and the last thing I wanted was somebody to tell me that I couldn't do something, so I just kept my mouth shut. I said, well, now how do you feel? She goes, damn good. And she, <laughs> she ended up doing the business. And her goal, though, was not to make hundreds of thousands of dollars. Her goal was to supplement Social Security, supplement her retired, and may, do something and make $1,000, $1,500 a month, which she is now doing. So it's really important that whatever you create, you write it out, I mean, so you speak it out loud. Um, ah, and remember that your plan is a living document. That's why I say putting it into a three-ring binder. Very quickly, I created a different way of doing business plans about three years ago. And I did it when I taught my first online class of business planning. Has anybody ever taken an online class? It's really weird taking an online class because you never talk to anybody. You never meet anybody. So what I would do is I'd do lectures, I'd put them on, I'd do PowerPoints, but you never talk to anybody. Everything's by email. And so I was trying to figure out how I can put all the sections of a business plan into what is called the Dropbox so people can do this stuff. And it became really difficult to do that. And finally, I came up with this idea, why not just ask students questions and have them answer the questions? And so I came up with 21 questions that basically gives you a business plan. And in fact, the 21 questions come from in questions that investors have asked me. And if you watch Shark Tank, and remember, Shark Tank is reality TV. So pretty much it's all fake anyway. But <laughs> It is, it, it, it really is. I know five people that have been on Shark Tank. It, it's, it's, there have been five, five or six people from Minnesota that have been on there. And because it's video editing, the video guy back there is gonna kill me, but because video editing can make it look any which way, you ne don't get the real story. But I require all my students to watch the show Shark Tank. And the reason I do that is not because it's great TV. I tell them, listen to the questions the sharks are asking. Listen to the way and watch the way people answer those questions. And you can tell which of the ones have that internal confidence to answer it properly and which ones don't. And the sharks are basing their decisions, yes, on a good idea and everything else, but on the confidence that the individuals have. So I created a way of doing business plan. It's called the 21 Question Business Plan. I got it approved by Minsku. I teach in my classes. I wrote a book, and this is now the textbook I use in my classes. It's also being used by two, by two colleges in South Dakota, and I have eight other colleges looking at it for this fall. Um, it's I'm not selling them right now. If you want this one, I'll autograph it for you. Oh, shit, hold on. You can, buy it on, you can buy it on Amazon for 27 bucks, or you can buy it off my website at 30. If you buy it off my site, why am I char more than expensive than Amazon? Well, because I'm gonna sign in for you. No, there's a, I throw in something else. I throw in an assessment I created called, Will My New Business Succeed? A couple of years ago, I wanted to come up with an idea of could I actually create an assessment for students to use to see if their business was gonna succeed before it actually started. It's actually now being used by some banks that when people come in for small business loans, they take the assessment first, so banks, you'd get that one for free. Anyway, I'm not gonna go through all this because I know we're running out of time. That's the stuff. Okay, and that is who I am. And that is actually my cell phone number. And if you have any questions, on business planning, on classes, or in fact raising money from angel investors or raising money in general. Um, and, and I used two words here earlier, debt financing and equity financing. Debt financing, as you probably know, is borrowing money. The good news about debt financing is you don't have somebody playing in your business, or as I call it, playing in your sandbox. Bad news is you have to pay that money back. In equity financing, 
Um, you may not have to pay the money back if the business goes away, but you have somebody playing in your sandbox. So there's good and part, bad parts of both. I have done a lot of equity financing, and I've also consulted with a couple other companies to help them raise money as well. So this is who I am. There's another wonderful picture of me taken by the college. You can't see my website, but I'll send you all this other stuff. Quick question. Oh, you're going to ask a question? Of course. I okay. Do that. Uh, <laughs> A lot of people already have a business up and running. Sure. And is there ever a time where you can't do a business plan? Can you do one midstream? Oh, yes. It, it, a lot of people will start businesses without doing a business plan. In fact, I would say that most of the businesses are started, the people never complete a business plan. So then should you actually do one after fact? Absolutely. And it's actually, in some respects, better to do it after the fact because you'll learn so much more. My recommendation, though, is not to do that. My recommendation is to do one up front, and then because this is a living document, every time you learn something more, you change it like that, okay? Um, should I open up for questions? If you have any questions, go ahead. Equity finance. Yes. So you have a target value for a company based on some valuation at the end of the period. Sure. sure. That's why. What multiple is that angel investor going to look for on the amount of money they give you versus the equity return if you get your target. Let me make it, make it a little more simpler than that because I've only raised money on startup businesses that have no value. And for their, so there's a type of, of investor that wants a business that already exists, has sales, all that other sort of stuff. My specialty is not that. My specialty is helping businesses raise money right at the very beginning when they have no sales, no track record, everything, and they're selling a dream and that sort of thing. 10 years ago, 12 years ago, when I was raising money for that, most people wanted what was called a home run. They wanted 10 times the return on their investment in three to five years. That was what they were thinking that they wanted to get. Now that has changed in angel financing. Angel financing has now gotten much more stable and the, and the people want less out of it. Really, they want now one or two times their money back in five years if they can get it. And I, I didn't answer your question, but that's really where they are right now. What ends up happening is there's a group of angel investors that, it, does everybody know what an angel investor actually is? I don't know if you know this. A, a shark investor gets into a deal for a return on their investment and they don't really care about the people and if the company starts to go south, they tend to eat the owner. That's why they call them sharks. <laughs> an angel investor is somebody who gets into a deal for a return on their investment, but they're actually there to help the company grow. They become friends to the company. I tried for two years to get my product called Video Buddy into Target, and I could because they're here. I could not do it because Target couldn't figure out where my product existed in their stores. And it was a video-based product. Was it a video game? Was it a video product? Or was it a toy? And because they couldn't make a decision, I didn't get anywhere. I, I brought an investor in. He runs a little toy rep company called Toying Around. He invested in the business, but he also said, I want to take this product to Target for you because I think this needs to be in the toy area. So I said, great, help me out. I'm dying here. 30 days, I had a purchase order for $750,000 because he went to Target and said, this is not a video product. This is not a video game product. This is a toy product. So when it comes to multiples, to answer your question, I don't, I, I'm not really versed on that. I'm sorry, I'm not answering your question, okay? Any other questions? So, at what, at what point would you recommend somebody actually going to a VC? Would you only recommend somebody approach an actual VC after they've gone through a, a, a round of Yeah, you're talking about venture capital, right? Venture capital will not even look at a deal unless you're trying to raise somewhere between three and six million. That's kind of the minimum. So there's various levels that you go through in, in fundraising of a startup. The first level is what is called, it's investor money. It's the money the investor puts in, whether it's time, energy, dollars, or whatever. Then you go what's to what's called the friends, family, and fools round, which is, <laughs> it is. You get your friends, family, and fools to invest, and that's normally to about 100,000 level. After that, you go to what's called the angel route, and the angel route can take you up to maybe half a million dollars, then you have to actually get legal and do what is called a private placement memorandum. Then after that is when you might talk about venture funding. Even if you were going after, let's just say you're going after a 500, let's just say a $5 million dollar deal. Right. Would you still recommend somebody go through around a round of angels and 
before you. Yes, in fact, most VCs, why it takes 90 days for a VC to even make a decision on anything is they do this thing called due diligence, which means that in due diligence is they basically research you. They turn over every rock in your business and figure out if it really is what you say it is. Having other investors in a business at that point in time makes a great deal of sense. And that gives them a confidence level that, okay, if these guys get it and they're reputable, it's easier to get VC money at that point. Does that answer your question? Okay. Anybody got any other questions for me on business planning or anything like that? Um, I could give, tell you where to go to classes. No. <laughs> if not, thank you very much. I'm going to be around here if you have any questions for me.